start with a film, thank you. A film from uh, uh, another guest which should have been with us tonight, which is called Gianni Pitella. He is Vice President of the European Parliament, and he will give his a few words, it's a very short address on how he sees the common good. Dear friends, uh, I would have liked to be with you today to participate in your uh, third summit. Unfortunately, my institutional commitments uh, don't allow me to come to Zermatt. I would like to welcome your initiative. Europe is facing hard times. A severe economic crisis uh, is hitting uh, our economies. This is not only an economic crisis, this is also a moral crisis. The root of this crisis is materialism and greed, the love for money in itself. But money cannot be an end in itself. It is just a mean to achieve a human and dignified life. A very important mean we should not demonize, but money is not life. Your summit is a crucial opportunity to reflect on how giving more value and dignity to human beings. As human beings, you are not alone, but we live in a community. The objective of life is to combine individual happiness with a sense of collect collectiveness and uh, kinship. This is the common good. The Christian tradition can teach us how to combine the individual and the collective dimension. The seminal encyclical Rerum Novarum, but also the more recent Caritas in Veritate have underline the importance of common good for our society. We, as politicians, should take inspiration by these documents. I am confident that the Zermatt Summit will open new roads for better understanding to concept of common good. I, I thank all of you for what you are doing. At the European Parliament, you can count on my support for your initiatives towards a common good. Thank you very much. We're in for a very interesting and important discussion this afternoon. If the idea of a common good simply remains as an idea, then we have wasted time and our lives would have been better used in another purpose. The only purpose of a common good is if it translates into a reality that changes what we do, that changes uh, the actions that other leaders take and transforms our world. And that is why the title for this session is, Is There a Common Good? Or is it just an idea? And if there is a common good, how can we translate that into a practical reality. Here we are at a point when the European Union itself is under tension and could even disintegrate, where we have nations who are only seeking perhaps not a common good, but a British good, or a French good, or a German good, or a Greek good. At the same time, we're seeing all kinds of tensions between the wealthiest and the poorest in the world. I've just come back from China. In the course of a year, it can take me into the worst slums in Africa and the wealthiest districts in Manhattan, uh, to the very uh, super elite of our world, the people who control perhaps 100 million euros of cash in their own personal bank accounts on the one hand, and spending time with communities of AIDS orphans at another who do not have food to eat. Is there a common good, or is this simply language? I'm interested to explore this with this panel, this particular panel, because of the strength and breadth of their expertise, which ranges all the way from being an ambassador to Russia and the Russian Federation, uh, to being a representative of the European Union during the Georgia crisis, from being an ambassador to the Chinese government, uh, to today 
uh, representing the European Union in Afghanistan and seeking peace at a time of immense complexity. Uh, and on the other side, uh, we have a cardinal who has a huge track record in terms of uh, representing uh, the, uh, the Catholic faith uh, more widely in our world, and more recently uh, holding uh, the distinctive responsibility for dialogue with all the different religious groups across the face of this earth at a time when there has never been such a greater gap, perhaps, in understanding between the, Jew uh, between the Islamic and the Christian communities. This is a hugely significant thing. And, in the, and tying all of these things together is the role of government. And we have uh, also a representative, an advisor to government uh, in Spain, someone who's had a long track record uh, of policy development in all kinds of different government departments, who understands how government thinks um, and the opportunities to change. So this will be an interesting, a very interesting discussion. But the most important elements will come from you and the contributions that you make. And so I'd now like you to give a very warm welcome and a, a round of applause to Ambassador Pierre Morel, who will share with us uh, his passions and his beliefs about how we can change the world for the better good. Thank you very much, Pierre. Merci, Patrick. Thank you very much, Patrick. I shall speak uh, French, so, so I we'll, shall give you a few minutes to get some earphones. So I hope you're all tuned in now. Now let me come back to my personal experience in terms of crisis management, because this is a good way to see whether there is a common good. First of all, at the international level. What is the international system that we're living in? I believe we can say we're in the second uh, globalization, the first one being unipolar, dominated by the West. The first discussions show us that now that, we, that we've moved into a second phase of globalization. And who is the master of this globalization? Well, there is none. Some, in, some may say it is the market, but it's not the market. It's not his own master. So indeed, in a way, markets rule the world, but markets don't rule themselves. So the second globalization is trying to find its way. Um, it has ups and downs. And I shall focus on the international uh, scene. So we're hearing the gospel, if I could say, i.e. there used to be a unipolar world that was not good, so now we have a multipolar world, a more balanced world, so it's better. So let's hope that nations can agree uh, with each other. But that is not the case. What we can see is that states are marshalling upward their forces, and we can understand that, but what is the end result for the collectivity? Well, to make it simple, to use old theories, we're back to international Darwinism uh, on a large scale. So the strongest will win and the weakest will have to uh, follow. Of course, I'm oversimplifying, but the hyper-Westphalian, hyper logic leads uh, to uh, a concentration of power, confiscation of resources and means. Now, this naturally will not lead us to the common good. And since there's no uh, red thread, like in the Cold War, there used to be codes, but we're no longer in uh, the same situation as after the fall of the Berlin Wall. We have conflicts erratic conflicts, worsening conflicts. So the landscape is changing all the time. Things get better every now and then, and things get worse also. So how can we manage these conflicts? Let me take a very specific example, that of Afghanistan. I'm a special representative for Central Asia. I went to Kabul last week for a major 
international conference. It was called the Heart of Asia. We want to we wanted to establish uh, confidence building measures around Af Afghanistan. Let me recall that there's pressure, mostly from the United States, uh, because of uh, upcoming elections. There's been the announcement of the withdrawal of the international coalition. So to ensure proper transition, as from 2014, we had to uh, uh, discuss a lot of issues. Some are already uh, thinking that things will collapse altogether. So this has led to a series of international conferences, and we said that we'll want to keep doing things for Afghanistan. A whole generation has lived in war since 1979, so we want to stay there but work differently by helping Afghanistan rebuild itself. So, of course, this is still fraught with uncertainties, but a lot has been done over the past years. And one initiative was launched last year, the Istanbul process, i.e. Uh, trying to establish confidence building measures, what could be done from neighboring countries in order to stabilize Afghanistan to help it transform itself. In Istanbul, uh, back in November, 41 measures were listed. So it's all fine and well. It's a good image of the future that we want, but how can you implement them? So we reduced the list to 15 operational measures and then to seven measures that we, that we studied in Kabul last week in a security context that I needn't describe. It was particular, very heavy. We were heavily protected knowing that at any time a tragedy can happen. So we are in a situation of risk, but at the same time, we need to commit ourselves. The interesting thing was that in the end, we were able to identify several, seven measures, measures against terrorism, against drug trafficking. I'll come back to that if you want. This is a major issue. Education, trade development, infrastructure development and building, connecting uh, chambers of commerce of all neighboring countries, and finally, uh, prevention of uh, uh, prevention and management of natural disasters. Let me take an example. This is indeed a serious issue, which happens to be uh, at the forefront of our concerns. Uh, Pakistan and the relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Pakistan uh, was hit by tragic floods a few years ago. Millions of people were displaced and are still not back to uh, their normal life. So. Uh, they can help, and neighbor, neighboring countries are implementing measures with partners, Europe, the United States, Australia, Japan. They said, we will come and support, we will bring financial and technical means. I'm not saying that that is the solution, but what struck me in this meeting, everyone came saying, well, what is it going to bring us? And little by little, synergies were created, including from China, Russia, Pakistan, and even Iran, because they came to attend, of course, to raise controversies as well. But they did try to do something. So what do I take from all of this? Well, the impression that we're all still looking at each other. but and we were meeting at ministerial level, we did acknowledge that things were happening. Of course, the future is always uncertain because the first reaction would be to say, well, we'll never find a solution. There's violence. We'll never get rid of it. But at the same time, I do have the feeling that let's wait and see where this gets us. But right now, here and now, this is what we have to do. And in case of doubt, well, just meet Afghan women. They're there. They're in parliament. They say, watch out. You can just go into hospitals. Equipments were established. And beyond all the tragedies and the civilian victims, you have to go to children's homes, to the poorest families, who have to get treated in Kabul, etc. There's telemedicine that makes it possible to do something in Kandahar, the most dangerous area, etc., etc. So what I get from this is that 
based on what's happening at the international level, you can see that there's a counter power, there's interdependence between states and communities, and this means we cannot go for this logic of confrontation. The market has broken trust that existed. Multipolarity means international uh, distrust. But at the same time, since we all depend on each other more and more, a counter power seems to be um, taking shape, what I would call mutualization. This is not just um, an ad hoc agreement, but a long-term commitment. We're getting out of reciprocity. Do it des, i.e., you do what's best for you. Now, mutualization goes beyond that. It means a mutual recognition, a sharing, and long-term recognition. So, and I've seen it in other crisis situations, like uh, in the war in Georgia, and the attempts at finding solutions. I've seen it in uh, the ethnic uh, massacres that I've worked on in Kyrgyzstan in 2010. We must try and foster uh, such commitments. Confrontation is just not possible. So this doesn't mean that we're going to create an ideal world overnight, but the logic of dialogue, reconciliation, and mutual recognition and long-term commitment is a logic that the European Union is fostering with its weaknesses, of course. It has the culture of compromise and long-term commitment. It has indeed a problem of management, internal governance. Yes, that's right. But I do believe that this identification of a long-term commitment logic, the search for common good at world level has started. And this is, I believe, uh, uh, the solution. We must, of course, always ask ourselves about the meaning of what we do, but let us not forget to listen to the poorest. Thanks. Thank you very much for those powerful and passionate words and that uh, talk of uh, reconciliation, mutualization. I think they're fascinating and I look forward to debating them. I'd like us now to give a very warm welcome to Cardinal Torum, uh, who will bring his own perspectives on these really important issues. Thank you. Obviously, I will share with you um, a more philosophical and theological uh, point of view on regarding common good. You know that this is part of the of Greek philosophy, comes from Aristoteles, uh, who distinguishes between uh, specific goods and um, which reside in the happiness of each and everybody, and a general good, which is the state, religion, politics, etc. Any society. Uh, will define itself according to its aims and objectives. And obviously, the aim of uh, human society is to enable mankind to fulfill himself. And this obviously needs requires a social dimension. And so therefore, society will have to um, suggest the, the appropriate values that will lead to happiness, such as truth, justice, solidarity, freedom, nonviolence, and participation in subsidiar with subsidiarity. Common good is defined in the Catholic uh, Church as the uh, common social good, which will enable uh, people, individuals to reach perfection. So by stating the digni human dignity, the Church only draws the attention to on the requirement to um, fulfill basic needs of um, mankind, food, um, shelter, etc., family, etc. But common good also presupposes that society will become a, a community and will therefore grow beyond the interests of mere groups. And to make sure that this does not remain simple, simply theory, but uh, really leads to common good, there is a genuine authority that is required which is going to promote universal values 
such as uh, freedom, truth, solidarity, justice, nonviolence, etc. And I'm not going to go into the details of all these issues. But I was reading Celine a few days ago, and I realized that uh, ethics and politics in for Aristotle are often the same, because good intentions are very often uh, accomplished, and not only in the case of the police, the city. And I would also now like to draw draw your attention to one issue which is often neglected, meaning that the Catholic Church takes um, the word seriously. Its social doctrine uh, shows that um, human or mankind and, and his development is a very positive value. God created man to for him to manage uh, the world's resources and he created a world where progress, technical progress also, is but one of the facets of creation. But these technical progress, the technical progress that enabled mankind to move forward and overcome illnesses, for instance. Um, this is not only at the service of mankind, but also can run against the service or interest of mankind, because technical progress can also be used in a very barbaric game. The problem, of course, is to know whether man will be in a position to control these uh, technical progress. If it is to be taken seriously, it is, however, remains but part of uh, creation. It is not a name in itself. And we realize that the uh, terrestrial, the, the earth uh, city on, the, in, on this world is very specific. It needs to create material conditions which will enable mankind to reach their full fulfillment and development. The use of material goods, the uh, friendship between man or mankind, there is also economic solidarity. But whether we can affirm that there is such a thing as human community um, for which we need to um, instruments uh, enabling people to communicate. And I will also insist on the part of God in a society, because without the presence of God, um, the uh, so society cannot um, continue. Now, to a Christian, the uh, uh, danger uh, in today's world is the not the lack of uh, faith, but the lack of adoration and the specificity in each and everybody's um, story, resources, fraternity, which enable mankind to reach uh, freedom. And this is, in fact, the aim of the interreligious um, debates. In fact, uh, this is only the but uh, common newer, and it can only, and this is what we can call, therefore, common good. And um, the common good defined in this way seems to uh, have three inherent uh, parts, the uh, personal development, social development, and uh, secure safety and security, and a just order. Jacques Maritain gives a more poetic definition of common good. He says that it is the, the good human life in the interest of a community. But it is really the measure of independence which is part of um, today's life, the, the recognition of an aspiration, the need felt by an individual for a relation with an absolute entity. And I would like to conclude on, an, on quoting Jean Rostand, the scientist, who in one of his latest uh, publications, uh, uh, when he talks about the uh, questioning of a biologist, and I'd like to quote him. Whatever the aspect of our cities uh, will be tomorrow, the shape of our houses, the speed of our cars, but what I need to know is what, what will be life's taste? What will be the reason for mankind to act and the courage to be? And he also says there is more to be taken from uh, loving than from taking. And uh, I think this is where I will conclude.
Thank you very much, Cardinal, for the and inspiring words. And now we're going to move on to a, another personal perspective. And I've asked each of the panellists, really, to tell something of their own stories through uh, the course of the panel discussion. It's not just the theory. It's not just the practice of how it might work out from the office point of view, from the official responsibility point of view. But it's how these things affect us as human beings, which I think is also very important. And I'd now like us to give a warm welcome to Emma Puig Simon, who is going to talk uh, from her own perspectives, but particularly also about the role of government. Thank you very much. Well, hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to start uh, giving my answer to the title of the panel. So, uh, is there a common good? Uh, and my answer is a total yes. Uh, the problem is how to define it. Uh, I'm sure that I'm not surprising you with my answer. Uh, that's why we are all here. But uh, I've been thinking about uh, how can we define that, and uh, we have heard several definitions. Uh, and I tend to believe that uh, who defines it uh, is every community. So every community has to find, uh, must find its own uh, common good uh, in uh, his time of history, in its time of history. Uh, then it does mean that uh, there is no universal uh, common good, uh, that it's not possible. Uh, no, I'm not saying that, not at all. I think that uh, communities uh, have their own uh, vision of common good, uh, but also uh, as they are parts uh, of bigger communities uh, up to the whole of the whole humanity, uh, there is also the possibility of the universal common good, which would be uh, some sort of umbrella covering uh, all of human, be all human beings. So uh, up to here, it's more theoretical. And as uh, our moderator uh, said before, the key point and the more uh, important uh, uh, step here is how to translate this theory uh, into practice. Um, well, I don't have the, uh, the real answer of that. But uh, what I can say from my experience uh, from the last decade in, uh, in government and uh, while doing public policy is that obviously the government has a big role uh, in the in the in defining the con not in defining sorry but in s setting up the a scenario that make help uh, to flourish the common good. Uh, but however, it's very difficult sometimes for government to uh, really um, follow our idea of the common good. Uh, they may have very uh, strong beliefs, and uh, as you may think uh, in their electoral programs when they run for the elections. Uh, but sometimes, uh, as probably you all know, I don't know personally, but also like uh, from real life, uh, it's difficult for them to, to follow the conception of the common good. Why is that? For several reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, it's because, as you know, uh, they are always uh, worried about uh, elections. Uh, it's always a short-minded uh, uh, perspective because they have uh, they have to run uh, for elections uh, when they are not the state elections, they are under the state elections or local elections, so uh, they are always competing. And uh, we are also in a, in a kind of a democracy that has evolved uh, to, from my perspective, to take some power from the demos, from the people, and give it to the m media and obviously to the economic uh, forces. Um, so that also politicians are very worried about the, the, the media and the, the titles and the pictures and the, the new message in the, in the news, more than in the content of their policies. Also the competition between parties doesn't help. Uh, if we talk, uh, for instance, as in the case of Spain that, uh, and if in the case of Switzerland and other states that we have a lot of uh, levels of government, uh, it doesn't help either when you have a lot of parties and you are, uh, for instance, you have a minority government and you need the help of uh, minor uh, political parties. Obviously, if you want to pass a law and you need uh, their support, um, normally they don't give you the aid for free. Uh, there is something normally behind that uh, gesture, and sometimes it's not uh, for the common good of the whole state, or uh, uh, if we can say so, or for a bigger community. Um, another problem is that there is also the, uh, still exists the classical problem of the capture theory. Uh, I know that it's quite obvious, but uh, it's true. I mean, sometimes politic uh, politicians and uh, policy makers uh, are also captured by some kind of uh, not, uh, not very global uh, 
uh, interests, but uh, very particular ones. Sometimes they don't know even that they are uh, doing that. They, uh, they incorporate in their own beliefs the private interest. I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, all of them do that at all, uh, but that's a, a problem also in our societies. Uh, obviously, sorry, a break. Uh, I'm talking from a Western uh, democracy perspective because before in the early in the afternoon we had some kind of uh, discussion about that. Uh, and also at, uh, another minor problem is that uh, I realize that sometimes when we think about uh, mm, politicians and we, uh, when, they, when political parties appoint uh, future leaders to be responsible for public uh, uh, goods or for public uh, policies, uh, the merit system doesn't work uh, always. A lot of times the so-called spoiled, sy spoiled system or, um, uh, I don't know, let's say another type of um, criteria, uh, maybe being involved in the interior, internal uh, political party life uh, has more value than maybe uh, being a strong in some other intellectual skills, uh, which is a shame, but uh, that's what happens. Um, so, uh, however, being said that, uh, what I have to say is that also in Spain I have realized that uh, there is a materialization of the common good, if we can say so, because uh, we have seen a real, uh, real um, examples of how people uh, are ready or willing to give up some of their welfare for the good of uh, the whole community, in terms of like being paid less, uh, working less hours and being paid less, uh, uh, having a minor, uh, uh, minor uh, subsidies, uh, because they understand that this is some kind of, of sacrifice for some kind of common good that in the future will revert in positive benefit for everyone. Uh, also, uh, taking uh, the words of Gianni Pitella that accompanied us uh, through the screen, uh, um, equally as him, I do believe that we are not uh, only in the financial or economic crisis. I think that we are in a crisis of values where the kings are individualism and money, as he said. And I think that I totally believe we need to change that. I think that uh, it's crea we are creating the momentum for that to happen, and I don't refer, I'm not referring to the Mayan uh, calendar, I'm referring more about the, the reality of the international world uh, with the shift of power from the west to the east, with the unipolar system ruled by the US coming to the multipolar system where no one is the boss, uh, as uh, Pierre Noel said before me. Um, so I think that we need to take the, the, the lead and try to, to think about that and try to make, that, uh, the po make it possible for us to integrate the East and the West and uh, try to figure out a, a common good definition integrating the whole humanity, which is a very big challenge, I know. I mean, I'm not being naive that uh, I know that we will not do, will not do that uh, these days. Hopefully, uh, I would love to do that, but uh, I think it's impossible. But uh, at least, what can I say? Uh, is that I can give some elements that I think that uh, they create the conditions for the common good to flourish uh, in, uh, in our societies. Uh, first, of all, first of all, we need to create a trustworthy environment. Uh, how can we do that? With uh, creating a strong institutions, both local and global. Uh, someone said before in, our, in the other panel about the global kind of government. Uh, that would be a great, but I don't know how to do it, but we need to think and reflect about uh, on that. I, I think it's more than the UN, I would say, uh, different. And also we need to foster transparency and accountability because that's the revolving door of trust and without trust there is no common good uh, definition possible, I think. And then we have to do our best to get uh, our citizens uh, with better minds and better souls. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, so they need to be more open uh, in terms of sensitive to the difference uh, and I'm going back to the East and West uh, uh, division, if we can say so. Uh, I think that citizens have to be exposed uh, to international environments uh, and uh, they need to mix with the difference because uh, not doing so, it's the, normally it's the root of uh, non-understanding in, in, in the politi politics arena. Uh, also, uh, through education, uh, we, I wish we could increase the responsibility of citizens because it has been proven by uh, several theories that uh, citizens, when they feel more responsible, they are more prone to achieve a more uh, uh, agreed definition of what a common good is. 
so just to finalize, um, uh, I would refer to uh, one big thinker that uh, once said that he, here you have my principles and if you don't like them, I can change them because I have others. I would say that that's precisely what we shouldn't do with uh, the, our effort to create a common good definition for our uh, human world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before we come to your own questions, I've got a couple of questions I'd like to begin the discussion with. One of the central themes that runs through all of this for me is one big word, which is leadership. And I think about the European Union at the moment, and I, I, I'm particularly addressing this, as, I guess, first to yourself, Ambassador Emeril, uh, which is uh, on the TV screens, we see a lot of uh, national good being talked about, what is good for us, a common good as a nation, which I guess is a start, rather than just talking about a common good for my family. Uh, but uh, how do we translate that? And one, my question to you is, um, I, I've been doing a, a global poll of uh, senior executives and leaders around the world in, the in about 10 or 20 countries in the last few weeks, and I ask always the same question. I say, please can you put up your hand if you can name me a leader of Europe? Someone who holds the vision for Europe as a common goal, rather than someone who is primarily being interviewed on TV as the leader of Spain, or the leader of UK, or the leader of France. Can you help us with this problem? Well, it's because it seems to be fundamental, this issue of leadership, yes. powerful, strong, visionary leadership that can bind a community together for the common good. I return the question. Do you think that 27 countries with real democracies, which are just getting out each government coming to elections in the last years can easily find one leader with vision and so on and so on. I mean, I, I have to return the question because this is what is the target uh, uh, for the daily life of these leaders. They know and they understand what they have to do. They go as far as possible and then they go back at home and are confronted with anger, frustration, if not worse. And therefore, I mean, this is probably, in a way, one of the most uncomfortable positions you can find. And at the same time, uh, it's the, the, the sense of common danger is pulling forward enough this structure to be able to work for survival. But it's, it's not overwhelming, it's not brilliant, and think and look at what the international press says the following day sorry, wrong, you, 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 you are in full mistake, and so mm. on and so on. Mm. So you are always wrong. Mm. I mean, I've, I, as you are, I'm reading the press, of course you, have, you need to have a debate, but uh, the fact is that uh, democracy is indispensable, this is our common belief, and at the same time, it's uh, hitting back in the most immediate way with intense media pressure, intense market uh, pressure, and therefore, I mean, some days you will think it's, it's Penelope's work, you know, uh, the night uh, uh, undoing what has been done in the day. So still, uh, I think that when you look at where the situation was at the beginning uh, in terms of functioning of the EU, the steps forward have been unique compared to, to the present case. So uh, I intend to, 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 to answer differently to your question. Why is it so? Because of too many good decades in complacency and easygoing, as simple as that. And it's not uh, just the leaders, it's everybody. I mean, let's be clear and honest with ourselves. No, just the situation of being protected, having honest or rather good prosperity, uh, progress in income for a wide majority, consolidation of, uh, let's say, uh, middle classes, a uh, sudden surge, and we know the story of the Irish tiger and uh, whatever, and uh, the success of Spain and so on, up to the moment when the sense of uh, wider purpose than immediate benefit is, 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 is running there. So, if we and so this, this is what we are paying now. If we were to paint a picture, let's, let's suppose uh, we can imagine a world in 2025, 20, uh, so mm -hmm. some distance away, mm -hmm. uh, we're now um, 13 years, 14 years further ahead than mm -hmm. now, 
Uh, and let's imagine that this cr current crisis has long history, mm -hmm. and that we, uh, the European Union has, has, has emerged stronger and more vibrant. Mm -hmm. Do you see a day where uh, we could have a, um, uh, a situation where every woman, man, woman, and child will be able to name the president of Europe and to, and to be able to identify a character on TV, perhaps an elected yes. individual, who they see as the person that they identify with and they say, this individual has a mandate, a European mandate, from the whole of our European community to lead our European government forward. Can you see that? Yeah, you, as you know, this has been the dream of Victor Hugo, Les Etats-Unis d'Europe. Uh, at the same time, uh, it is a situation in which we know very well that uh, the convergence of 27 countries, 28 soon, uh, will not uh, let thousands of years of history uh, go away. And therefore, this basic line of unity in diversity is the only way for Europe. Nobody is re ready to renounce its identity. So the question of leadership will move step by step. Uh, and frankly, even if it may look uh, inappropriate, uh, I would do uh, and, and, and respond uh, any other way. And this, I think, is also a lesson for the long term. Without uh, the new permanent presidency established uh, by Lisbon Treaty, I don't think the European Council would have, would have held together in this crisis. I, I really believe it. And I've been in many European Councils, and I've had real, you know, sometimes you have in the media uh, little shots with this, uh, for the pause in these endless nights of the European Council. And frankly, remembering of some of the session, I said, my God, they, they, they have all the, the bad faces of tired people, exasperated people, and where do we go? Mm. And, and you have the sense of danger. And I think one must pay tribute to uh, somebody who has been called Mr. Who when he started, Mr. Van Rompuy, mm. who has been the uh, convener mm. and the shaper of the survival compromises which help EU to continue. Mm. But it doesn't mean he's the leader. And he would, if he would pretend to be the leader, it would be a failure. Mm. So we are, we are in, in transition. You can, and this is at the same time the hyper of the world in which we are, and the, 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 the pressure of the opinions because of the economic situation, this is the push button uh, approach. Uh, it, I mean, we started the European uh, Action uh, Service out of different groups. I mean, you know that merger of units uh, of companies takes two or three years. And we were accused of failure in the following months. What do, we do, what do you do? Where are you? And so on. So, I mean, it's heavy, it's complicated, it's 500 million people learning to live uh, in the future together. Mm. This is terribly complicated, and at the same time, this is the way we have been doing step by step in the last 60 years. The reason why I, 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 I'm probing here is because yes. it seems to me that uh, uh, in a way, this is a microcosm of a wider yes. issue in our world, whether it's on global warming and agreement mm. between Russia and China and mm. America and the European Union, that these require the same, the same forces that the European Union is having to go through are forces that we will, we will need on a global basis to achieve anything like a common good being established. Indeed. I, once again, I mean, uh, we have been, with all our goodwill, we are being ready for a rather smooth mm. world, uh, an easy cruise, uh, somewhat uh, uh, in a rather peaceful history. Mm. And what we get is a rough seas and, and the need to stand and keep the post in difficult but at least we are still in peace. And when we think that the European Union was created in part to prevent a third world yes. war, and in that we have been supremely successful. Can I just turn to the Cardinal? Um, you have a, 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 a privileged position traveling the world. You have just flown in from Lebanon, for which we are really grateful. We know that you had an important conference, again, on interreligious dialogue. Do you see this issue of common good uh, being uh, discussed in other faith groups, or is it mainly in one or two? No, is, it, is it a common <coughs> issue, in your view? Well, not outside Europe, I must say. What, uh, what uh, you see, uh, what is important that we try to tell to our, especially our non Muslim friends, that there is only one motivation which can 
justify that a human person exercises power on another human person, you should serve him or her. Uh, you know, Talleyrand used to say, la politique, c'est une manière d'agiter le peuple avant. Politics is a way of agitating people without, before using them. Yes. And so um, it's very difficult for um, the, uh, uh, an Islamic society to, uh, to, uh, to, have, to have this approach of uh, gratuitous service to the human person. Of course, I think the great, mm, perhaps the great crisis we have in, in Europe is, what I should say, the crisis of interior life in a broad sense. That, uh, as Pascal used to say, le grand malheur de l'homme, c'est qu'il ne s'est pas resté en paix dans sa chambre. So we are, and I remember that last year I sent a message at the end of Ramadan to all the Muslim uh, leaders of the world, and it was about the interior life. And I have been amazed by the number of, uh, of letters I received from all over the world thanking the Holy See to have recalled this necessity of uh, uh, reflecting on who we are, what are we going to build, and I think the common good is exactly what we need, uh, just to take time to look at the other, to listen to him, to understand what he, he believes in and so on. Otherwise, it will be always very superficial. Thank you. Well, this is your opportunity now. We have uh, three wonderful panelists. And would you like to put up your hand and I will come to you or someone else will come to you with the microphone if you'd like to make a comment or a question. I'd like you to stand up and say who you are. Oh. Hello, you, Stuart. my name is Stuart Drew. Um, I was just wondering, just in the spirit of being provocative, that is there a common good? Answer, no. If you think of the so-called Amazonian undiscovered tribes, would most of us agree that there was a common good operating in that environment? No EU, no religions, no finance, no money. And would you argue that perhaps, therefore, the common good is only really possible on a localized level? And what I was thinking of years ago when we didn't travel as much, when there wasn't so much in the way of international business, where languages were spoken by the people who lived in that area, and a foreign language is extremely rare. Was that a better environment to create the common good than today's diversified, globalized business, which by definition mixes cultures in a way that's never been okay, done before? Okay, so the question is, has development, in its sense, eroded the possibility of a common good in different communities? Cardinal, would you like to perhaps Sorry, answer Can that? you repeat the question? The, the question, I, mean I think, at root is, as our world has become more developed, more globalized, more technology, the invasion of one culture into another, uh, or different empires coming and going, have we somehow lost something of the opportunity for common good that you might see perhaps in a very remote tribe in some remote part of Indonesia that has managed its own affairs in a very strong community yeah. environment for a very long time? Have we lost something? Perhaps the sense of community. And I think when uh, sometimes uh, I, I met um, young Europeans who are converted to Islam, and what attracted me is I mean, the sense of community. Because they, human, or they, they, they feel they belong to, and they are supported by, by their fellow believers. No? I think perhaps we, we lost that. Uh, yeah, I think we have lost uh, the sense of community and also uh, we have lost some sort of a spiritual life. I think that's the, one of the most important problems in our Western societies. Although some people do follow some kind of religion, uh, there is a lot of people that uh, they say that they follow the religion but they don't, they don't at the end. I mean, it's more about uh, a social, uh, uh, a social mm -hmm. etiquette than uh, real uh, beliefs. Okay, thank you. And now with another question, Jean-Francois. Yes, good afternoon. Jean-Francois de la Vison. I am the president and the founder of uh, a foundation which is uh, working in the field of global health for the more underprivileged in the world. Um, just one comment and one question. The comment for me is traveling all over the world. My feeling is um, in countries where people succeeded to bridge cultures, countries like Brazil, like India, it's much more easier for them to look for and to be, I will say they are more advanced than us, which are working more, much more in silos and educated in the field where we don't have any connection with the others. Uh, in our education, in my education, I was educated to say, and my parents said to me, 
don't meet people who don't have the same political ideas than yours, religious ideas than yours, and I think in those countries, they succeed to do it. But there is a point that you didn't mention for me, which is very important, is you didn't speak about youth. You didn't speak about jeunesse. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me, it's not a question of culture, it's a question of, it, uh, of, uh, of generation. And I will say that the youth, the young people, the young generation are much more advanced than our generation in the field of looking for common good. I think that's certainly true. I call them the M generation. They are the people who are whose entire adult life will be lived in the third millennium. We're going to take another comment or question uh, first. A brief my, comment, comment. My comment is just triggered by the uh, former gentleman's uh, question. Uh, it's really uh, puzzling uh, to me. Uh, if gr I mean, my understanding is that youth, you may think, or we might think, that globalization is has destroyed sense of community. I was, and I, I would like to believe that globalization brings us together. So it would be ironic if what brings us together destroys our sense of community. This is, yeah, quick I, I'm, I'm that. just leaving the, quick, yeah. Quick, uh, uh, this is a perfect, perfect uh, one for you. Uh, thank you, I, I react a bit because yes, we, we, we can be very critical about uh, some of the things we, we, we may feel we have lost. But please remember that uh, 30 years ago we were in a world of deterrence uh, with a real uh, system on one side and another side ready to shoot uh, with uh, megatons and, and just kill millions of people. I mean, this has receded in background. This is easily forgotten, but the, 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 the world system was structured around this kind of situations. So uh, we have moved uh, from this context. You have had a complete transformation of uh, Europe, the, the, the wider European continent as such. Yes, uh, transition has been difficult, uh, indeed. Uh, it, uh, it is still difficult, but uh, it has represented the end of a blockade for uh, hundreds of millions of people in a way. Painful, complicated, but a sense of future, future reopened when they were told that history has, had decided for them, full stop. So let's not forget that. Mm. Another element on, on this uh, sense of community, uh, I think that the, the answer, and it comes back to what uh, Cardinal Toron said. I mean, you are best at living together when you are conscious yourself of your own roots and your, of your own richness, rather than forgetting it in running after the immediate satisfaction. And this is how I would understand in, uh, in uh, personal life uh, whatever the, the commitment, uh, you, you, you come more easily and you share yeah. more easily when you have some self-confidence about where you come from and who you are, uh, not from external satisfaction. So yeah. uh, let's look for this sense of uh, wider exchange and yeah. life in common and not just tolerance, each in its corner. And that's why I, I always re uh, I, I react to, to the, the multi the multicultural or multipolar, because it means the, the plural disappears. The sum in the community is considered as anymore not possible. And this is the danger, each in its corner. So let's, let's think of different le levels of both personal conviction and sense of community. I think we, we, we are not seen in such a bad situation, but let's realize where are the keys. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, you know what? I'm pleased to be alive at this time. If you think how many wars there were in Africa until recently. Mm -hmm. I, I often say this. Can you think of a war, that, a big war going on between two countries at the moment? Can you? Can you? It's difficult. There are plenty of conflicts inside some countries, but very few truly international conflicts. In fact, there is not a single one. We have a few border conflicts, and I thank God for that. And out of peace, we can begin to build a common good. Someone said you could define earlier today, said you could define the common good by first understanding the common bad. Well, a big common bad for me is war. It's when countries are fighting and killing and slaughtering each other because of the language they speak or the territory they live in. And I thank God those wars have largely stopped. That gives me hope that we can go from war to peace and from peace perhaps to common good. We have another comment here from the back. Manfred. Just about what you just said. War is not only bullets. 
There are terrible wars without any bullets. I'm talking, going to talk about that tomorrow morning. But anyway, <coughs> um, I was here this morning on the now extremely interesting everything. But I'm concerned with one thing. This has been a very humanistic discussion. And you should realize that humanism is very arrogant. It puts the human being at the center of everything. And what should be at the center of everything is not the human being, but life in all its manifestations of which we are a part. I cannot conceive any possible common good if we do not learn how to integrate ourselves into the magic of complete life. I haven't heard a single time the word nature or other forms of life. And I want to bring them in because they are as important as we are. I'm really and without pleased. them, we are done. I'm really pleased, Manfred, you've made that point. I have a whole hour on that tomorrow, so we will enjoy that. And your comments too, as well. Now, there's another one here in the front. Yeah, thank you. I'm Rui Teillard, lawyer in an international public company. Um, my, my reflection is that uh, the 27 European countries will probably um, manage to get together unified because they have, I think, more than a common interest, which we talked about in politics. They have cultural um, commons, uh, I would say common good together. My question is that in this uh, pluralization of the, the world will be possible for the world to have uh, to manage to be together. If I ask a Chinese or an Indian guy, will he answer me the same thing about common good? Will we have the same definition that will bring us together? And I'm not, not sure of it. So okay. I'd like, I'd like Who would like to answer that? Emma, so would you like to? I think Cardinal and uh, Pierre Morel can so answer. <laughs> Pierre? I am not sure I understood everything. Yeah, do you want to? I, I start, and so uh, maybe there's a follow-up. Uh, uh, I, I agree with you uh, on the point that it's, if it's multipolar, it's because these countries have very strong determination, have a sense of even some kind of revenge in history. I mean, what we call the BRICS, uh, the emerging countries, uh, you hear the message, now it's our turn. Uh, like it or not. But at the same time, if it's a tit for tat and it's, if it's a zero sum game, we are lost and they are lost. And this is the very important hidden lesson. Look at the summit of G20 at Cannes. I, we could not read all the results. Uh, last year, China was offensive, but careful not to be too offensive. And then we raised uh, the question. What about agriculture? But, uh, what about money? Are you a stakeholder? Well, careful. Careful because it entails responsibility be beyond its own policy. And they will have to. It's not a matter of lecturing. It will be in their interest to enter into this process. And it will move step by step. But the need of involvement in the common cause, call it common ground, will be a necessity of interdependence. And they are realizing that now because they have their own economic problems and so on. So whatever the belief, the determination, the strength of the ambition of the emerging countries, which is a fact and we cannot ignore and we have to take that into account, they have to look at the, f the, 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 the return impact of their power and the wider consequences. And that's why interdependence leads to look at the interconnection. So it, to, to, to simplify with words, I would say maybe we are in a multipolar world and this is dangerous. Let's look at the interrelation, the interdependence, and look at, a th at and think of an interpolar world. This is the real problem. We speak about the importance of interpersonal relations. I don't, we cannot systematize. But clearly, this is how we will interact, which is counting. If, if we just wait for the high sea fleet of China commanding the whole uh, 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 Far East and so on and so on, we are all lost, including China. 
I'm sorry to say that, because spreading fear will not help China in the end. And this is the internal logic of what I call the counterforce. The problem is too big. The problem of water will not be solved by a national policy. Nobody has the solution. We have to sit together and we have to play, make full use of this counterforce because, yes, uh, you have dynamic and rather wild uh, policies and ambitions acting now and uh, emerging in the world. But regulation will have to come. And this, the, this is the voice which is not imposing, but just widening the conscience of the interdependence. I hope this leads to further comment. We're just uh, at really at the end of our time, but I have just uh, one thought. Uh, you challenged us on the issue of mutualization rather than just cooperation, uh, and has been described earlier about the, you know, we have had the extremes of the, the, uh, the, the Cold War, the, uh, before that the, the communist ideal, which was then lost. We had the old capitalist ideal, which is now coming under question. Do you think, uh, I'm a question to all three of you, do you think it's possible that future generations will see the rise of a new ideology, which is as radical as communism was when Karl Marx was alive, that will help to drive the kinds of changes that our world will need to deliver the common good. Do you think that is possible? Well, <coughs> shall I answer? I think this is very difficult to foresee, but what is, according to my opinion, the most important thing today is the way we teach history to the, to the young generation. So what I said yesterday in Beirut, I remember I visited, when I was foreign secretary, I visited Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, by car, I went to Sarajevo, Mostar, and Banja Luka. At the end of the week, I read my notes, and I was received by President Izbegovic. And I told him, Mr. President, I visited three countries. So if you want to build one country, it depends the way you teach history. And for the Muslim world, it's exactly the same thing. The way is at school, teaching history, you forge a nation. And uh, we, we have to have a clear-cut identity in interreligious dialogue, but in political dialogue, the same thing. If you don't have a cl clear-cut identity, who we are, where we come from, there is no possibility of f future, because the future will be a shared future. Thank you very much, uh, um, uh, uh, Cardinal. Uh, as the Cardinal said, I mean, I think it's very difficult to foresee if it's going to be possible that a new Karl Marx uh, will appear in uh, promoting the common good in the near future. Uh, however, as the person in the public referred that uh, we are all becoming very global, I think that we are all becoming very global, but more in the interpersonal relationships. And uh, as the Arab Spring showed, uh, there is some kind of... Uh, I would say partially global movement that uh, may arise and why not uh, in the future, we don't know how many, how many years from now on, uh, it could happen that some kind of uh, ideology uh, towards the global common good can appear and can have like a, a, not a political party, but some kind of uh, ideological corpus behind. So, yeah. Ambassador. I think that any radicalism in the more and more complex world would be uh, some kind of nightmare, let's be frank. Uh, and uh, we see, and I must say this is something I'm looking for in uh, leaving soon my own mission, is uh, uh, to look at how to safeguard uh, diversity and pluralism of cultures and beliefs in the world, because uh, otherwise, I mean, the weight of the majorities will be dreadful for minorities. And this will be a loss for the for the human person. Uh, there we speak about diversi diversi uh, biodiversity. I think we have to care for no diversity, the diversity of our spirit. I think this is unavoidable to safeguard, and it will not be easy because fanaticism and simplification and overwhelm uh, messages and banalization through the media are real. But uh, I think that precisely because of this interdependence. Uh, ethics of responsibility will have to grow. Otherwise, we will all will be together unmanageable ourselves. Mm -hmm. And ethics of responsibility implies belief, sense of personal responsibility, and at different levels, sense of community. Mm -hmm. 
uh, some kind of citizenship step by step towards the rest of the world. It would be very difficult. Once again, it's a big challenge. Uh, and I don't think it means forgetting about our, uh, ourselves. On the contrary, our communities, our commitments, our history, and unity and diversity is, is basically something we painfully learn in the European context. It's no easy way. It's not a bed of roses, but at least it secures the ability to live together. Thank you very much. And just to wrap this thing together, for me, you know, as, we have, as we've been listening, uh, there are two words that have uh, been uh, powerfully in my mind. Uh, two great forces which, uh, which stretch our world and pull in two apparently opposite directions. And both we need, I believe, to see the global common good. One is tribalism, the most powerful force in the world today. And the other is universalism, that celebration of what it is to be part of humankind. And my observation is this, as I travel around the world, and I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure you echo this too, that at times we worry about our world becoming so universal that we lose our own cultural identity. McDonald's is everywhere, and English becomes the international language. <laughs> okay. And that's a serious issue. But the internet has driven it and has made our world small, and, has meant the, and CNN has made it even smaller. And so we've been able to watch each other's lives around the world as some universal whole, and I'm grateful for that. But I'm also grateful that at the time when we become more universal, we also are coming to understand the importance of being tribal. And indeed, the more universal we become, the more McDonald's is everywhere, the more Gaelic in Scotland, in the north of the UK, becomes an important language. Ten years ago, there was no Gaelic spoken hardly in the UK. Now, every road sign is in English and Gaelic. We have Gaelic radio stations, Gaelic universities, and I noticed that Scotland now wants to be out of the UK and into the Euro. I think that, <laughs> not quite, I'm exaggerating, but it seems that the more universal we become, the more we value what it is to be a family, a tribe, a community, a nation, the more we appreciate our languages, and the more tribal we become. You mentioned Yugoslavia, a nation which became so bitterly tribal that its nationhood was lost because tribe began to, to fight tribes and indeed we landed up with four countries instead of one. But it's interesting that inside Yugoslavia, the old Yugoslavia, we have countries which are stampeding to become part of the European Union. Why? Because the more tribal they have become, the more universal they also seem to want to be. So I hope, my prayer, is that we can learn to do both we, as you say, that we can learn what it is to respect and celebrate each other's tribes, but also recognize that common red thread that runs through all of humanity that says we are human beings together, made in the image of God. We come from the same genetic stock, from the same basic design, and we have a shared destiny, and we can only find our purpose and our full heritage by working together in mutualization. And with that, I'd like you to thank this eminent panel for their wisdom and expertise. Thank you.